Hello, this is Joe Uden, owner of Touring Israel Luxury Private Tours. Today, we have a special guest, the owner of the Israeli Cool blog site, um, exposer of anti-Semites and anti-Zionists around the world, David Lang. Uh, welcome. Thanks for having me, Joe. How are you doing? Um, you know, going a little stir crazy, getting sick of my kids. We're, we're in the midst of the coronavirus right now, so we've been on lockdown for, for three weeks. Don't get me wrong. I love my family. But uh, I'm 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 ready to to take my mountain bike out and 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 hit the hit the fields around the kibbutz soon, lockdown or no lockdown. How how about yourself? Yeah, you you pretty much said that right now. I mean, you look like you have a good background there. I don't know what room you're in, but I'm quarantined. Well, not really quarantined, but I'm in my bedroom right now because I've got five kids and two noisy dogs in the house. So it's not like I you know for this interview I can just sort of you know find my man cave and, and be comfortable there. So uh, I think we're all making do. And uh, yeah, as, as you said, I mean, we hope that this whole situation is over real soon. All right, so let's get started. Um, you know, a lot of your, your, your blog is actually very popular um, for what it does. But before we get into that, where, where do you come from? What kind of upbringing did you have? Uh, what what made you leave your, your place of birth and come to uh, the land of Israel, the state of Israel, and how long have you been here? Well, this is your life, huh? <laughs> um, okay, so as, as, as people probably can tell from my accent and also from the fact I've been going by the name Aussie Dave for quite a while, I'm from Australia. Um, I'm from a place called Perth, which not everyone knows about. Uh, Perth is on the west coast of Australia as opposed to places like Melbourne and Sydney, which are the east coast. And uh, you probably know this, you're, tour, you're in the tour, tourist industry, um, you know, but yeah, no one knows. Perth is actually the most isolated city in the world, as far as I'm aware. That's an interesting bit of trivia for you. Um, so I grew up there, um, and at the time of, uh, when I was about 19, I started, so I, I grew up a secular Jewish person. I went to a Jewish day school, had a very, uh, you know, Zionist background. But, you know, not much more than that. And I started delving into, you know, the, the age when people are normally rebelling. Uh, <laughs> I actually sort of did the reverse. I sort of anti-rebelled because, I, you know, I had a lot of freedom and I did pretty much whatever I wanted. And I wanted more meaning in my life. So around the age of 19, I started looking more into Judaism through a whole bunch of experiences, which I won't go into all now. And I, yada, 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 I decided I was going to spend a year in Israel studying in the yeshiva, uh, just to learn more about the religion, whether or not this was something I wanted to pursue as an Orthodox Jewish person. Mm -hmm. And to cut a long story short, I spent a year in a place called Efrat here in Israel, and I very much enjoyed the time. I found it very spiritually satisfying. And from that point on, with a few bumps along the way, I more or less decided I was going to become a, you know, a, a practicing Jewish person. And I, you know, I finished university. I came back from uh, Israel in 1994. I'd already done a year of Israel, law school and commerce. And I returned to university, completed my degrees, worked for an oil company in Australia. And to, again, to cut a, a long story short, I was online and I met my future wife uh, who was living in Israel. And I deliberately was trying to find someone in Israel because I just, I knew I needed a push to want to make Aliyah, to immigrate right. to Israel. And what better push is there than meeting the woman, you know, th that you want to marry? And right. uh, so I made Aliyah in 2000. Uh, no, uh, what was it? November 2000, around the time of the second Intifada. So not a great timing from that point of view, but no. <laughs> I'm glad I did it. And we got married not long after. We'd already, we were already engaged by this point. And I've lived in Beit Shemesh, different parts of Beit Shemesh ever since. And so that's pretty much the uh, if your wife Ahava. She, she was she born? Is she a Saba? Was she born in Israel, or was she also from the Anglo uh, world? Yeah, So she, uh, my late wife uh, Ahava, she passed away last year. Mm -hmm. um, she was born in the United States. She lived in California, and her family made Aliyah in '91, right after the Gulf War, uh, deliberately. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and yeah, she, she was living down south, and uh, yeah, so she's she was Anglo. She was sort of she she made Aliyah when she was sixteen and a half. 
16 and a half, 15 and a half. Oh. So she lived actually most of her life here, but it was sort of almost a 50-50 split. And so culturally, I'd say she was a bit in between. She didn't relate to full-blown full Anglo. And at the same time, she wasn't full-blown Israeli. She was somehow a real amalgamation of the two. Right. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I remember you going through through uh, her, her when she got sick. It's uh, and, and unfortunately, some of the people who who uh, don't like your blog uh, try to get to you using the fact that your your wife was sick for, for a long time and, and has since passed. But but we'll get to that. So so tell us, you came to Israel. You, so you came rather late in, in the year 2000. I know I John and I made Aliyah in the early 90s and, and we've been here for a while. So and we met in the in the army. Um, did, did you do the army or you were already a little too old to, to do that when you got here? Yeah, so giving away my age now, um, I was over 26 when I made Aliyah, almost 27. And I did the tests and the army just basically didn't want me. You were too um, old. Because of, I guess because of age, but maybe because also my Hebrew at the time wasn't maybe up to par. Um, it's a shame because, you know, I, I believe I could have contributed even to the IDF spokesperson's office, which I've contributed right. since then in in unofficial ways, shall we say. Okay. Um, I really wanted to do the army as a, as a Zionist, but yeah, they basically didn't want me. And I should also point out that at the time of, I think my second test, Ava uh, dropped me off and she was very, very pregnant and I'm sure they saw that too. So uh, right. I'll, I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they, you know, they had uh, empathy on my family situation and so they didn't what, want me. When, when I was drafted, I was already 23 years old and they did, the army did everything they could to make me just some desk jockey for a year and then get rid of me forever. They're like, I mean, we have a very big army for a country so small that there's too many people. So when someone doesn't want to do the army, they really don't have to do it. And when some older 23, 24, 27 year old comes in, they usually don't want us. They try to, I, I, I had to be sent to jail before they would give me a chance to try out to be a paratrooper go figure but that's how that's wow. how it is luckily for me they, they they let me do that and and i served you know doing my reserve duty until i was until i was 40 years old so the army doesn't always know they don't know what to make of people like you and me who come here in their 20s and want to do the army and contribute to society that's that's something that that doesn't happen so much anymore but but you've contributed to the zionist cause in in ways that many, even most, I would say, soldiers um, haven't contributed. I mean, your 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 um, love of Zion, your your love of Israel, uh, uh, has has blossomed into this incredible blog. Some people consider it a, a white right wing uh, conservative uh, kooky, um, no hold barred uh, 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 rag. Um, I'm not one of those. You know, some of the things I do read in your in in, in your blog makes me cringe sometimes. Um, but I, I I do read it religiously. I even tell my um, uh, tourists, the, the ones who I guide personally, uh, that they should check it out. I mean, one of the greatest things that you you did, and and I think one of the greatest things that you're known for is exposing the anti-Semitism. And I'm not talking about anti-Zionism, uh, anti-Semitism of you know, Pink Floyd, great Roger Waters, and everyone, every Jewish New Yorker that I that I talk to knows that this guy is an anti-Semite, and most of them have even stopped listening to, to Pink Floyd. Why, why don't you tell us a little bit about how that whole thing unraveled? There he is. Yeah, sure. I just had to laugh because of the screenshots that just happened. You were talking about, you know, some of the language on the blog or alluding to it. Um, wait. So, how did un how did the Waters saga unravel? Or well, why don't you tell me first, uh, in general? Yeah. How did Israeli Cool start? Um, how, where where has it taken you? I know. It, do you have another job that you're working at, or is this something that pays your bills? You know, let's start with how, how what gave you the idea to start it, and how did it uh, explode into this? It, it's a big deal. I mean, you how many readers do you have? Um, well, on an average day, I would say around 10,000 or so uh, visitors to the site. But of course, when there are, you know, things like wars and uh, certain posts that go viral, 
uh, it can balloon up to tens of thousands of, of people. Um, regarding how did it start, like a lot of things in my life, by almost by accident, <laughs> actually. But I, I do see the, the finger of God, if I can put it that way, in, in, in terms of what I'm doing and, and you know, uh, guiding me. Uh, so go back to 2003, and I read some article about this new thing called blogs. I, I don't even remember how I came across the article. Maybe it wasn't even Google back then. What was the search engine back in 2003, Bing or something else I don't know. Um, yeah maybe that yahoo anyway so i found out about this thing called blogs yeah yeah right i'm still on the yahoo mail by the way don't, don't tell anyone anyway so i found out about this thing called blogs it sounded a bit like uh something from star trek like captain's log not that i've ever been a big trekkie although a big william shatner fan of course anyway so uh i digressed uh i found out about it. i decided to open one up on blogspot some people still have blogspot blogs i believe and I just started writing, and my first post was uh, something, Joe, maybe you know about it from our mutual friend, Jono, something called Cricket, which is uh, something, it's like baseball, but a lot better. And um, I, I wrote a very asinine post about the Australian cricket team. And uh, go back and, and check out how bad that post was. It had nothing to do with anything that I'm writing about now. And it was just a, basically just a, a diary, a way to rant, showcase what I thought was something of a sense of humor, or was hoping was a bit of a sense of humor. And um, that was in March of 2003. About six months later, we took out a Hamas terrorist uh, called, uh, I think, Rantizi. When I say take out, by the way, I don't mean we went on a date with him. We <laughs> took him out with a uh, Tomahawk missile or whatever it was, mm -hmm. assassinated him, liquidated him. And a guy in Australia linked to my blog post. Now, this was quite a milestone for me because the guy from Australia wasn't related to me. Up until then, everyone who read my blog, all five of them were relatives, my mum and my dad and other relatives. Um, but this was a guy, and I didn't even know how he found my blog post. So it was a real, uh, what we say in uh, Israel, Nafal Asimon, uh, an aha moment. And I thought, wait a minute. Through search engines or however, this guy found the blog post and he reposted it. And I got way more traffic, it went up from like 10 to, I don't know, 30 people at the time. I was like really excited. And I thought, wait a minute, I can actually do some good with this with this blog. I don't have to write about the Australian cricket team anymore. I can focus more on what's going on in Israel, uh, being Zionist, being sick to death of the, the mainstream media bias against Israel, which in 2003 was just as bad as now. Um, so that, that's when I decided to, to focus more on it. And it just grew over the years with some kick starts around the time of the Second Lebanon War in 2006. You know, I've been a bit of a war profiteer. I don't say that proudly, but before Twitter, um, people were visiting my blog and some other ones for live updates. This is before the likes of the Jerusalem Post and well, well before the Times of Israel was even in diapers. Um, um, there were just a few blogs like mine which were doing live updates. And this was when Twitter was in its infancy. So, oh, wow, okay. That's an ugly looking blog. Uh, so I was doing uh, live updates. I'll be at work. So at the time I was working for a uh, software company and um, you know, in my breaks, I did, definitely did my job and I worked very hard, but whenever I had like in my lunch break or whatever, I'd be typing on the computer, updating from different sources. And I, you know, that's when I think I, the, the blog reached more popularity. I was interviewed on the PC and other uh, news sites. And I think that gave the, the blog a bit of a kick up the backside that it probably needed. And I've just been going strong ever since it's become a passion. And I, it, was, it was a hobby, a pure hobby, until um, last year around about June, I quit my, my day job. Now, when I say I quit my day job, it wasn't a pure leap of faith. Um, as, as I've mentioned, my wife was very ill. She passed away in August. But uh, through, let's say, a NES, a miracle, um, the software company for, which, for whom I was working were laying off people, but they weren't just laying off people. They offered voluntary retirement packages or voluntary oh. retrenchment packages. Obviously, because I was already working from home for, the, for a year and a half. It was, I was mm -hmm. working part-time because I was a, a full, almost a full-time caregiver for my wife. And uh, therefore, it was a no-brainer that I take the package. So the package gave me some breathing space, of course. And now I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing Israeli cool full time. Um, 
So I'm still trying to get it off the ground. I want to create a non-profit from it. I'll create a non-profit for it, rather. Um, I'm still in process. The coronavirus came along and I wasn't able to have my first AGM in which everyone signs all the documents to incorporate the, the non-profit. But that, that's sort of my goal, um, you know, because I have a lot of people that would like to contribute, would like to support their efforts. And um, they'll rather, you know, their, their contributions were tax deductible, which is more than, uh, you know, I understand. <laughs> right. So, you know, one of the big things, I, I don't know if you, I don't remember if you were the first one to expose Roger Waters for his anti-Semitism or if you, you it, it led to that, but there's been this back and forth between the two of you somewhat. Uh, how did how did that all go down? I know Roger Waters came here in, in I think around the year 2000 to do the wall and, you know, the BDS guys sank their hooks into him and, and showed him a side of Israel which really doesn't exist. And he's been anti-Israel, even anti-Semitic, definitely, uh, ever since. Had, how did that all go down? Yeah, I don't remember exactly when I when it caught my notice, but obviously when I see some injustice, when Israel is being unfairly maligned, I take notice. Uh, coupled with the fact that I have a bit of a fixation on celebrities, good and bad, pro-Israel and anti-Israel, and the reason that isn't just you know that I'm a fanboy, but basically I see the power of celebrity, like it or not, and I don't really like this fact. But celebrities have a bigger voice than me, Joe, and it's just by virtue of their popularity and their followings, and they've got a reality. And I saw very early on that Roger Waters wasn't being truthful, no. and that he was unfairly maligning the state of Israel. And over the years, you know, I could do my my homework, and I'm not someone. Although I, I do, as you alluded to, the fact we might talk about it a bit later. You know, I'm not afraid to to call those anti-Semites. Right. That doesn't mean that I'm loose with the, the um, trigger finger. I'm proof. So right. I've actually, you know, compiled a list of statements from different visual videos from Roger Water interviews and form where I prove, and I've got a YouTube video on this, where I prove there's an anti-Semite. And since I've put out that YouTube video, I've even got more material. It's just very, very odd that this guy isn't just an anti-Zionist. And in most cases, no one is just and anti-Zionist, but there's real Jew hatred behind it. And regarding right. um, Roger Waters even knowing who I am, uh, to this day, he probably doesn't really know that you know who David Lang is, but my blog came, probably at least came to mention when Alan from the Alan Parsons Project retweeted a blog post of mine really ripping uh, Roger Waters and you, you know what. Right. I was very I really proud of the fact, not that Roger Waters knew who I was, I really don't, give her, you know, what's about Roger Waters and if he knows who I am. But Alan Parsons, who, very pro is a guy, a very decent guy and a great musician, uh, saw my blog post and not only that, decided, you know, what, I'm going to give it to Roger Waters, who's putting all this pressure on me to to, to boycott the, the state of Israel, which I love performing in. Right. That's, if you just let me interject for a second, that's what really got me, you know. So that's people, pretty much it. People are uneducated out there and they're anti-Israel and they they may fall into the anti-Semitic trap and be borderline anti-Semitic, not, not realizing what they're saying. That's not the case with this guy. This guy pressures artists not to come to Israel, whether it's Radiohead or Santana or whomever. Whenever an artist that, that, that I love um, wants to come to Israel, there's always there back in the background, Roger Waters writing them a letter telling them not to come to Israel and then lying about us. Now, you know, there's an argument to be made about the occupation, whether it's legal, whether it's not. Um, that's a whole nother issue. And, and, but, but when an artist like that singles out Israel, um, and doesn't talk about any other country and, and is, is obsessed with this idea that artists shouldn't play, there's the Alan Parsons uh, uh, retweet of, of your blog, shouldn't play Israel. That I mean, it's hard enough being a lover of Pink Floyd for so long, seeing them in concert so many times myself, uh, growing up with Dark Side of the Moon, and just absolutely being one of my favorite um, groups of all time, and then and then being being singled out 
was such a personal insult to me. And it really breaks my heart that this guy uh, has, has fallen um, so hard. And if, if anyone out there, you know, if, if you doubt what we're saying, you should read what David has, has written. I mean, he's basically just quoting the guy. And that's the thing that gets my goat a lot when I'll, I'll point to your blog as uh, of articles of, as evidence of so-and-so's uh, anti-Semitic statements. And they're like, Oh, that's a right wing rag. That guy, he, he curses all the time in his blogs. It's he's a little kooky. And I'm like, look, he's just quoting people and then giving his opinion on, on those quotes. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Well, let me answer that because I've heard that before. Right. So first of all, a lot of people not even give my blog the time of day. Do you right. hear? Sorry, we're, we're cutting up a little bit. Um, now what I was saying is a lot of people and I've said that I've seen this is that they won't, even open a link to my blog because of the name is really cool. First of all, a lot of people will not even give notice to my blog or pay heed to my blog. And you know, in the, in the beginning when I started the blog, I wasn't thinking I was going to be a pro-Israel blog. I just liked, I'm a bit of a pun meister, uh, a master of bad puns as it were. And um, I just, it's stuck and it's very catchy, the name, but it's not particularly smart. And you know, if I was to rebrand, I probably would change it to something else, but I've done 20,000 or so posts and I've got a brand and, Look, I sort of justify it this way, that the, the sorts of people who are not intellectually honest and will not even open a link to my blog, um, they're not the people which I'm trying to influence. They're, they're, they're beyond the pale. They're usually the people that have made up their mind. I find that a lot of people will take the time of day to read my posts. Now, um, I wouldn't say that I swear all the time. In fact, I try not to swear, but I do use some salty language. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's partly because I'm Australian and that's who I am and I'm trying to be authentically me. That's my sense of humor. Um, on the other hand, I think that I'm trying, there is a bit of strategy or a lot of strategy to what I'm doing. I'm not just sort of this sort of hot headed guy uh, typing without giving any thought and just swearing. I, I mean, that's not what I'm doing. I'm really giving it a lot of thought. And the way that I see this is one um, sort of weapon in our arsenal or weapon in my arsenal is to be quite entertaining at what I do. And um, I don't want to, you know, there's so many blogs out there pro and anti-israel blogs and to stand out you really have to stand out in some way and i try to do that with this, the humor that i use with the um you know with this uh sort of how, how should i say it uh, irreverent kind of tone to my blog posts um in addition to real fact checking you know at the end of the day facts matter and i'm very careful with what i post in terms of making sure that i'm fact checking so there's a real serious part it's not all fun and games and and of color jokes. Um, I will point out also, Joe, so I, you know, that's definitely a criticism that I've heard and it's, I take it or leave it, I take it seriously. But I will say this, that I don't believe that my blog just preaches to the choir. I've had people from the Arab world read my blog and, and uh, when I used to do a podcast back in the day, which is now, uh, you know, uh, no, no longer, no more. And uh, I had a, a fan, one of my biggest fans that podcast was an Arab uh, Muslim woman from uh, Kuwait and she actually um, she wasn't pro-Israel and she wasn't even pro-Israel after my necessarily after my podcast but she said that I gave her voice and I humanized Israelis and she liked my accent and um, for whatever reason she became a fan and she even to, to the point where she actually um, Wikipedia page which has now since been taken down by anti-Israel people but uh, nevertheless, I think this uh, story illustrates that um, you know, if people do take the time to read what and they're sort of at least they're not rabidly anti-Israel, I still believe I can make a difference and do make a difference, even with some color jokes and some salty language at times. Oh, no, you absolutely are making a difference. And uh, I could tell you the impact you were having when I started um, reading in other uh, websites like the Jerusalem Post and the Times of Israel and uh, even more mainstream places, the same exact things that, that that you had pointed out. And then I realized they were also reading your blog. And, and only recently did they start to cite um, um, your your blog. I mean, have, have you noticed that as well? As has Have you pointed that out to the various news organizations? that they should uh, uh, be more careful in inciting your work? That's a polite way of putting it. I do have a bit of a bee in my bonnet when I know something came from my blog 
and then it's taken from just say the Times of Israel, not to mention any particular news outlet. Oops, I just did. Um, and I know it's from my blog because I've even sent a link to someone that works there, and they just take the story and they don't cite it. And then it's not I just I feel that I'm not just representing myself, but I'm representing all bloggers because bloggers are very much undermined, I believe, even after all of these years. And actually, uh, so many bloggers like myself, I consider myself at times a bit of a journalist. You know, I'm, I'm I didn't go to journalism school. I, I went to law school, pretty cool thinking skills. But, you know, doing your fact-checking and putting out stuff which you believe is true based on actual facts and evidence. And I just, I think that it's not out of just credit, it's not an ego massage, it really is just fairness. Um, I'm constantly putting out new stories on my blog and I'm linking to the Jerusalem Post that they are my sources. You should always, that's just good practice. So I've noticed that I, I have shamed some of these news outlets on Twitter uh, before and some have... Um, change their ways a little bit, and some really haven't. Um, it's not a big focus of mine. I'm not going to spend too much time doing that. Uh, once in a while, I decide to poke the bear, and I, I do do that. Um, yeah, I just want a bit of fairness. Right. I uh, actually absolutely loved reading your your latest article here that uh, was published yesterday or today about um, – the supposed journalist who who went out to take pictures in Gaza of the of the destruction and desolation in a blown up bus that the Israelis destroyed with one of the Gazan uh, children and and as you point out and you do this so much I mean you must have hundreds maybe even thousands of examples of of stories like this uh, the people who actually use this as as propaganda you know to to demonize the Jews. Um, uses a picture of a, a a blown up bus from Rwanda and claims that it's Gaza and you expose it. Whatever happens to these exposés and you've done it so many times. Does anyone ever have to pay the price for disseminating this false information? Um, yeah, yes and no. It sometimes happens. Um, first of all, I want to give a lot of credit to my readers. So I spend a lot of time putting out this and doing the investigating. But without my readers, I'm I'm not nearly as effective. Uh, many times a reader will point me to a particular uh, item that they think might be fake. And sometimes they've even done a lot of the research themselves and I just pick it up, package it, put it in the form which I believe will, will go out virally, hopefully. Um, in this particular case, I found it myself, and I just knew that this was fake. I felt something was amiss. Whenever I see a photo from the Palestinian side, I always do my research on it because so often they pass the photos as from other parts of the world as from Gaza or from the Palestinian-controlled territories. In this particular case, by the way, Joe, it was worse than that. This wasn't just ripping off a photo or a few photos from other parts of the world, but this was a PR agent, an advertising agency paid to create Photoshop composite pictures, take elements from different stock photos from all parts of the world, putting it together and packaging it as from Gaza. So this, there was money behind this. Right. So, so that, I, I, this, I just, this is out from hot of the press. Right. So does that was from Botswana. So I'm hoping this will go viral. Do you point things like out, uh, like this out to the to the Israeli government, and do they would go on and sue the the uh, the PR firm that put together such you know vile um, lies? Yes. Yeah, so I have um, given this to contacts that I have in the Israeli government. Yep. The whoever is anti-Israel and is watching this. Yes, I do have contacts in the Israeli government. I'm not getting paid by the Israeli government. And if anyone from the Israeli government is watching this, I would love to be paid by you. <laughs> uh, but I'm not doing it for the money. Um, yes, yeah, so I have. I'm hoping that that's exactly what will happen. But getting back to my point about readers, so I've had the, the reason I got to the point where I found out that these were photoshopped was because of readers. You saw in that uh, screenshot that you just showed to the viewers that there were a number of updates. So my initial post was basically just showing that this was done by an ad agency and that I suspected that there was a lot of photoshopping being done. But then a number of readers, more than one, went and they did their own research on it and within, within came back to me saying, oh, here's the source of this photo. Here's where the bus is from. Here's where the building's from. And I was able to add that really I do look at Israeli cool, although I'm... The publisher behind it, I'm the sole owner, 
and more or less the sole writer of Israeli Cool, this is a complete team effort. And it's me and my readers, um, including you apparently, Joe, and, um, you know, we can all really make, hopefully make a difference. And I'm, I'm, I hope the Israeli government do something with this. Um, one of my readers actually also did contact the ad agency, asking them to retract this and issue an apology. So we'll see what comes of that as well. Oh, interesting. Where Where is this PR firm? What country? Oh, um, they're, they're, they've got a branch in South America. So it's a South American branch, San Diego, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, is that, no, somewhere there. I, 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 South America. Um, right. and, okay. um, but they're they're worldwide PR firm, ad agency. So um, th there's some big people behind this. Okay. So uh, the, I'll, I'll be interested to see uh, the updates uh, to that. So what's what's the future of your blog? Uh, the, or my last question to you. Where do you see it going from here? Um, we have a new government, which is the most bloated government in the history of Israel that uh, <laughs> most of us are pretty skeptical about. Um, it looks like the same government with a couple more guys who have no influence on uh, domestic policy. What, what is 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 that going to have any effect on the peace uh, process? Is is the government too distracted to deal with propaganda issues that you yourself have have taken on? Do you see any any any? My, my, my question is this: Israel is not doing well in the propaganda war. Not doing nearly as well as you, one guy. And your and your and your readers are doing themselves. How can the government, or how can we, uh, a pro-Israel uh, audience, uh, and you help Israel get a better image in 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 the media? Well, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? Um, I don't have any fast and easy answers. A lot of time, a lot of times, there are things that our government does that it's hard to, yeah. let's say, the optics don't look good. And the uh, pro-Israel advocates like myself a bit on the back foot, even though there might be some underlying reasonings for it, the optics aren't that good. And most people don't have big attention spans. Um, so it, it, may, it, does, it definitely makes things difficult. And the government has sort of gotten wiser um, in recent years, and you've got the Ministry of Strategy who are trying to cooperate more with bloggers like myself, Israel advocates um, of all organisations and trying to cooperate more. And I think that, because I think past the government, dare I say it, there was a certain arrogance to the way the government operated and that they thought they knew best in every aspect, even though, people, you know, foot, I, I liken it to like foot troops ground. There's some of us who have been doing this for a number of years. We're dealing with, you know, people relationships uh, in terms of readers, in terms of viewers or whatever whatever it is. And we sort of have a better understanding of life on the street. We're not in our ivory tower. We're sort of having these, uh, even people that have been you know, on chat forums will have a better idea of what life is. And this is something that's come to me, uh, you know, as I said, 17 years of, of experience. And I'm not the only one by any. I'd like to see the government even more cooperate with us more to uh, the government are putting out a lot of content um, on so the packages up, and I think that's great. But and uh, you know, again, I'm not going to pull any punches. They're putting a lot, you know, some money into it. I don't know how much money, but they're costing money to do this. And a lot of times, they're just packed stuff that people like me, people like others, have already uncovered, have already spoken about. And um, perfectly honest, I'd like to see the government put a little bit of investment into the grass pool. That, let's say they're the Sierrat Makal. They're the sort of special forces. Right. They should look at us as the special forces that are getting out there in the field, getting ourselves a little dirty at times. And um, I'm not talking about huge amounts of money. I'm certainly not expecting them to finance the whole operation. I, I definitely need to be independent. Any others like me value our independence so I'm throw a few bones away and instead of trying to then redo everything with nice memes fancy graphics you know th this takes a lot of time a lot of research so i think the government could do things smarter um the government could probably do a lot of policies enact a lot of policies in a smarter way <laughs> but that's a different discussion for a different day 
Well, thank you, David Lang. I certainly love your blog. It's called Israeli Cool. You can find it online. You can subscribe. You can donate. You can share on Facebook. You could share on Twitter and LinkedIn, all your social media. Uh, it's right up there, in my opinion, with uh, Honest Reporting and with Memory.org. Those are a couple uh, uh, other pro-Israel uh, uh, media sites that, that you can check out. David, thank you for taking your time uh, to spend with us. Uh, a shout out to Jono Rose in the background, our tech guru and a Israel specialist for touring Israel. There he is, Jono. Thank you so much. And uh, people, subscribe to my YouTube channel Hi, and share this video. Thanks again, David. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Great. Great to be here. Take Be well.